Before we get into the normal episode, I would like to do a little self-promotion. I am an internet game master for hire. Whether you're a complete beginner looking to try the hobby for the first time, or a longtime veteran looking for the perfect game, I've got you covered. With over 20 years of game running experience, I am ready to run the game you're looking for. Kick down the doors of a high fantasy dungeon. Navigate political intrigue and skullduggery in the halls of power. Run a resistance movement against the sci-fi empire and anything in between. If you're interested, please contact provenparadox at gmail.com. My rates are $30 an hour for the entire group, which means the costs are split between every player. I have a custom rule set that I can run these games from, or I can learn another system that you want to try. I have already spoken to Nick, and he is ready to be a player in this thing as well. So, if anyone out there is at all interested, please send me an email. Now on with the show as normal. Hello, my name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions. And I'm Proven Paradox, a guy with a lot of questions. And you're listening to Bright on Buddhism, a podcast where we discuss East Asian Buddhism, answering listener-submitted questions from listeners just like you, and introducing concepts of Buddhism that you may or may not be familiar with in a casual, conversational setting. Enjoy. Hermit, have you ever experienced concentration that was truly singular and one-pointed in nature? Perhaps, though I think the Buddha might disapprove of the source. Before I accepted the robe and bowl, I spent much of my time writing fiction. As part of this, I would create worlds with words. That process, building and simulating a world and its denizens clearly enough to pluck the image from my mind and put it on the page. When I was fully immersed in it, perhaps that was the sort of singular concentration you're describing? Why do you ask? The Buddha challenges us to attain such concentration in our own practice of meditation. What is this concentration supposed to be directed toward? Toward the Dharma, toward emptiness, toward impermanence, and toward suffering. Toward the nature of all reality exactly as it is. And why ought we direct our concentration thus? Many say that they understand the true nature of reality, the true Dharma, and the true meaning of impermanence and suffering. Does the Buddha say something those people do not? He says that we ought to direct our concentration thus, not for concentration's sake, nor for the sake of earthly or heavenly benefit, but for the sake of the end of the suffering for all sentient beings. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Bright on Buddhism. This week, we will be discussing samadhi. What is samadhi in Buddhism? How does one attain it? What happens when they do? We hope you enjoy. So, what is samadhi in Buddhism? Samadhi is defined most broadly as a state of intense concentration achieved through meditation. The word is a Sanskrit word that actually predates Buddhism and is quite significant in early Hinduism, which we will discuss in a moment. In defining the word and giving some discussion of its etymology, I would like to give a note or two about methodology. On this show, we frequently take Sanskrit words apart and talk about how they are put together and how the way they're put together affects their meaning. But we should note that this is a difficult and complicated process, and there are a lot of etymologies for each Sanskrit word we discuss. Sanskrit is a textual, a liturgical, and a dead language meaning that it's not spoken or used in the present day, and is only used in holy scriptures in history. Thus, making linguistic sense of it, especially in English, is a highly interpretive and complicated process. Let's talk about some of the different ways that we can break up this word samadhi, spelled S-A-M-A-D-H-I. The way that Yogacara scholar Dan Lusthaus carries out the etymology of the word is to split it up into sam and adi. Sam means to bring together or to gather, and adi means to place on, to put onto, to impregnate, to give, to receive, causing it to be interpreted as a whole as the bringing together of cognitive conditions, or bringing the buried latencies, or samskaras, into full view. So the obscure and hidden become clear objects of cognition, and it's the womb through which insight is born. So this is very complicated, and he takes a lot of interpretive leaps, we might say, whenever he gives this etymology. But we can see that 
one of the common threads is that it's gathering together something and applying that gathered together something onto something else. And in the context of Buddhism, we're interpreting this as gathering together all of your thoughts and mental conditions and applying them to a subject on which you are concentrating or being mindful. And doing so, according to Dan Lusthaus, is the womb through which insight is born. Another way that we can break this word up is into sama, meaning the same or equalized, the convergence of two distinct things based on some commonality, and adi, higher, better, most skillfully achieved. When we break it up this way, it causes it to mean the skillful unification of mind and object, or the mental equanimity conducive to and derived from attention perfectly focused on its object. So that is kind of breaking down the subject-object discrimination that we have, which I should mention is a modern discrimination, but is useful in interpreting the meaning of this word as being whenever your mind is singularly focused and one with the object of its focus, which in the case of samadhi ought to be the dharma or emptiness or impermanence or something like that. These etymologies are very strong and they indicate lots of important aspects of the Buddhist usage of the word, but we should note that Dan Lusthaus's interpretations are heavily influenced by his scholarship in Yogacara, which has a very specific and sort of unique interpretation of the nature of mind in the grander scheme of Buddhism. In Theravada Buddhism, there is no such idea of the absolute unity between mind and object, wherein the meditator and the object of meditation are interpenetrating with each other. That is only one end of the spectrum. In Theravada Buddhism, on the other end of the spectrum, samadhi is often broken up into the roots sam, a, da, which means to collect, to bring together. The idea is that it is the extreme and heightened state of concentration whenever you gather all of your mind into a singular stream of consciousness. One could argue that this is not significantly different from Dan Lusthaus's etymology by saying that a result of intense concentration is the complete unity of mind and object, but I think there's a subtle underlying difference here that's worth discussing. The difference is in the type of meditation being discussed. In our discussion of the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, or the Sutta on the Establishment of Mindfulness, I mentioned that there are two types of meditation in the early texts that are worth mentioning and discussing and defining. One is Vipassana meditation, which is meditation by means of concentration on a mental object for the purpose of inquiry into its nature as being impermanent, empty, and marked by dukkha. The other type is Samatha meditation, which is meditation by means of practicing calmness and tranquility of the mind and body. Before we go on, we should note that these are not separate methods or separate practices at all. They're two sides of the same coin. Inquiry into the nature of reality requires calmness and tranquility, and calmness and tranquility are byproducts of inquiry into the nature of reality. In Theravada Buddhism and in the Pali Canon, Samadhi is regarded as an attainment that one gets when they practice and perfect these two qualities of mind, Samatha and Vipassana, indicating that it is not just the unity of mind and object as in Dan Lusthaus's definition. Instead, Samadhi is the concentration and the calmness that results from meditative practice as a whole. Um, so when we're talking about breaking down Samadhi as a word in the language, since Sanskrit is a liturgical language, that means that there's not any writing about normal life written in Sanskrit, really, is my understanding. So because it's liturgical, that means it's just in the holy texts. That's right. At least during the time period that we're talking about the lifetime of the Buddha, it was strictly for holy texts, strictly a holy language, kind of like Latin for Catholicism. Right. That would make translation and localization way more difficult because there are no examples of these words being used in different contexts to be able to translate them. That's exactly right. You only have the texts themselves, which all kind of follow a similar pattern of usage of the language, being that they're using them for liturgical purposes. And whenever it's so singular as that, it makes it that much harder to understand what's really going on. So because samadhi is clearly such an important idea in Buddhist practice, the story for samadhi doesn't end at the definition that we've just come up with. There's a connection between samadhi and the jhanas, 
that I should explain here. Samadhi is one of the components of the Eightfold Path, right concentration, or in Sanskrit, sama samadhi. We can define this as the correct or right method or practice of meditation. This means meditating on emptiness and compassion and not on hate and ego, for example, or meditating by means of calm concentration and not by means of frantic anxiety, for example. Because this is the kind of practice one ought to do, as proposed by the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, right concentration is often defined as jhana meditation. We've talked a great deal about the jhanas, and we'll talk even more about them in the future because they're so important to the Buddhist tradition. We can briefly describe the four jhanas as being 1. Joy born from seclusion and freedom from unwholesome states. 2. Joy born of concentration or from doing the practice that leads to samadhi. 3. Equanimity with regard to pleasant and unpleasant stimuli. And 4. A state free from both pleasant and unpleasant mental states. Here you can see that samadhi is the gap between the first and second jhanas. The first jhana is the product of overcoming the five hindrances, which we've discussed before. It is literally the momentary sensation of joy, contentment, and freedom, which results from being alone and not feeling anything bad. To get to the second jhana, however, is a much taller order. You have to get on the way to samadhi. We'll talk in just a second about how to do that. Then once you do have samadhi or you're well on the way to it, you attain equanimity in the third jhana, and then you can abandon even the sensation of equanimity in the fourth jhana. I would be remiss if I didn't mention here the importance of the term samadhi to religions outside of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Sikhism. I won't be able to be as detailed and nuanced as in my discussion of its importance to Buddhism, but I can give the broad strokes here. In Hinduism, samadhi is a divine meditative attainment that one can enter into at the moment of death. As such, it is the step that is necessary in order to completely realize and attain the unity of one's Atman, or their soul, and Brahman, or the whole universe. You'll remember that this is one of the important goals of Hinduism, realizing and attaining oneness between your little piece of Brahman, and all of Brahman. This is attained through sustained concentration and practice. In Sikhism, which is a theistic religion from the Indian subcontinent, samadhi is a pure and uninterrupted unity between the mind of the practitioner and God. Both of these schools of thought have meditative or mind practice traditions which are directed toward attaining samadhi through meditative and ascetic practice. How does one attain samadhi in Buddhism? This is something that's heavily debated all across the history and the texts and the doctrines of Buddhism. There are many ways to attain it, and there are many developments over the course of Buddhism's history that reimagine this state and reframe practice according to it. However, in the broadest senses, we can say that samadhi is a state that is separate and distinct from the default daily life experience of a regular person. In our daily lives, we have distractions, anxieties, joys, things that make us mad, sad, all of these different sensations that pull us away from our concentration and from our presence in the moment. We experience a range of body states that sometimes include calm, but not always. And we make use of parts of our mind which, according to Buddhism, perpetuate our poor state of existence. We use discriminatory, calculative, and discursive thinking to solve problems and interact with the world and people in it. And so samadhi, then, is freedom from this stream of distractions, from states that are marked by pleasure or unpleasantness, such as anger, sadness, and joy. And it's also freedom from counterproductive uses of the mind, such as discriminatory, calculative, and discursive ways of thinking. You might be thinking to yourself that all of this is a description of what samadhi isn't. It isn't unwholesome mind states. It isn't unwholesome uses of the mind. It isn't this or that. So what actually is it? It is a state where the activity of the mind has slowed, quieted, or unified in a singular direction, where the body is calmed in every sense of the word, both physically and metaphorically, and it is a state where a person feels free from delusions, distractions, and the things that our minds like to grab onto and ride throughout our daily lives. It is a slowing or redirection of the stream of consciousness, you might say. The way to get to this differs in each school of Buddhism. Some have prescribed methods of meditation, some have flower arranging and incense appreciation, some have walking meditation, some have martial arts practice, 
But I would say that because every mind and every practitioner is unique and different, the method to attaining samadhi actually differs from person to person. I believe that everyone has experienced samadhi in their lives at some point or the other, whether they know it or not, and they got there in different and unique ways. Some people get it from hiking, some from sitting in a specific posture in a quiet room on a cushion, some from driving, some from playing music, some from playing video games, some from running, some from writing, etc. The key, in my opinion, is not how you attain your samadhi, but how you know that you have attained samadhi so that you know how to get back to it. When you know that you are calm, that you are singularly concentrated, that the experience is free from distraction or delusions of capital S self, that the experience is unique and different from everyday life, and you know that knowing all of this does not interfere with or interrupt your samadhi, then you're there. That's like an A plus right there. So what happens when a person attains samadhi? Once somebody experiences samadhi and knows that they have experienced it and attained it, then the benefits in Buddhism are said to be endless. The experience itself is said to contribute to the arising of the seven factors contributing to enlightenment, one of which is samadhi itself. The reason why samadhi itself is said to be conducive to the arising of samadhi and the other six factors is because it is part of a positive feedback loop. Samadhi is a cause for the other six factors, which are mindfulness, keen investigation of the dharma, energy, rapture or happiness, calm and equanimity. These factors together are also causes for samadhi, causing this loop where advancement on the path of enlightenment is spurned further forward. When one experiences samadhi, then the experiences of joy, mindfulness, etc. are open to the practitioner as byproducts of the practice, or rather as dependently arising with samadhi itself. It's also an important point to remember that there is no duality between the goal and the path of enlightenment itself. So I can say that these seven factors can contribute to enlightenment, but they can also be a result of enlightenment. Factors can be contributing factors, or they can be describing factors or characteristic factors. Enlightened people don't become enlightened and then stop meditating or stop practicing samadhi because samadhi is sort of the whole thing. In the texts, it's often called one practice samadhi because samadhi is the one practice around which the rest of Buddhist practice ought to revolve. Samadhi is also intertwined with the six bodhisattva perfections, which are generosity, morality, patience, energy, concentration, and wisdom. Some of these are shared with the seven factors of enlightenment, such as energy, and others are a reflection of how values change in Buddhism as the bodhisattva path becomes ever more emphasized. For example, generosity is not one of the seven factors of enlightenment, but it is one of the six perfections that a bodhisattva aims to fold into their daily life experience. Similarly, attaining samadhi causes the practitioner to become wiser, more generous, more morally upright, more energetic, and all of these different factors. This helps us understand a little bit about the specific nature of samadhi and its context in Buddhism. The idea is that as a result of correct samadhi practice, then one will necessarily come to deeper understandings of impermanence, emptiness, and suffering. And because of their knowing about these things, they will then become more moral beings because of sympathy with or pity for the suffering of all sentient beings. In addition, they will become more joyous as a result of freeing themselves from suffering by coming to know how to defeat it or overcome it. You can see how samadhi is like rocket fuel on the path of enlightenment. It all starts and ends with samadhi. That being the case, the question then becomes making samadhi into a constant experience as we proceed through our daily life. This is, as you can imagine, extraordinarily difficult. It takes an enormous amount of discipline to practice. As an example, imagine the amount of practice it takes to learn to speak a new language all day, every day. You have to learn the language, which means learning all of its grammar and vocabulary and such. You have to speak it all the time, which means constantly conversing, using that grammar and vocabulary that you have learned, and you have to learn how not to think in translational terms. That means you have to learn how not to translate everything in the new language into your native language in your head as you speak it. Fluency is a lifelong practice. Now, scale that up to your entire way of being, your entire outlook on life, your stream of consciousness, your beliefs, your actions, and behaviors, all of that needs to be changed according to this samadhi scheme. In Buddhism, it can take even more than a single lifetime to accomplish this. 
They say it can take as many as three Mahakalpas, or three great ages, each containing extremely numerous rebirth cycles. Furthermore, in the context of Buddhism, the idea is to direct all of that practice and change toward the realization and practice of the Dharma. You aren't just learning any language and then speaking that every day. You're learning the Dharma and doing that every day. There is a wrong way to do it, as in not doing the Dharma. As a result, the only way to know specifically what to do and what not to do is to study the canon of sutras and the texts very closely. It's also very important to work with teachers, since to do it alone, correctly, is incredibly rare and difficult. Around this concept of samadhi, you can see how the Buddhist monastic tradition comes together historically and religiously. We hope you enjoyed this week's discussion of samadhi. Join us next week, where we will discuss possession in Buddhism. What is possession in Buddhism? What are its doctrinal origins and applications? How ought we interpret and understand it? We hope to see you there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. My name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions and voice of hearer. And I'm Docs, editor, question asker, and voice of hermit. And this is Med Bright on Buddhism. Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, or if you have a question you'd like us to discuss, we'd love to hear from you. Please consider leaving a comment or review, subscribing, or joining us on social media. Email us at bright.on.com dot buddhism at gmail.com or find us on mastodon at bright buddhism at mstdn dot party as always citations and resources for this episode can be found in the show notes thank you